Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, uh, Dean. Thank you, Fadauer family. It's a great honor to be here and it's a great uh, pleasure to be able to talk about uh, immigrations, uh, immigration with you guys. So uh, immigration is a topic that uh, is uh, always uh, at the forefront, but it's an old topic. Just as I started, I put here some images that, that summarize some of the controversial attitudes that Americans have had uh, on immigration, as you see, starting from 1890, when there is uh, an American chivalry uh, soldier there mistreating a Chinese immigrant, uh, Uncle Tom looking in 1900 at all these uh, Europeans coming in, the guy with the head uh, hat uh, where mafia is written on is probably one of my co-nationals coming back then. And uh, in 1920, uh, this is a, uh, it was an advertisement of some meeting that happened at some school uh, in the United States. And of course, uh, the wall that Donald Trump promised to uh, build. So uh, immigration is a lot of passion, a lot of sentiment. But for a moment today, I will want you guys to put aside this and pretend that you don't know anything about immigration. And I'm going to give you some numbers. I think I'm going to start from information about some very, I think, interesting and important facts about immigration. So we'll do a little immigration numeracy, so literacy about putting in perspective some of the numbers. I will start there, giving you some facts that you don't know. That, sorry, first I will start talking about some facts that you know, put in perspective, and then I will give you a couple of facts that probably uh, fewer of you know, and then we'll go to analyze a little bit what are important global trends, and then we'll zoom on the US, and we'll talk about immigration in the US, and we will talk about uh, what we think the impact of immigrant is, uh, and we will distinguish between immigrants who have low level of education and high level of education, and I will finish giving some policy ideas, which I think are important, uh, uh, something that we need to, uh, uh, we need to learn from the facts and then move on uh, to policy. So first, let me stay on the newspaper titles at the beginning. Let me stick with you and take two very hotly debated topics of current immigration. One is, of course, uh, as you uh, may know, the refugee crisis in Europe uh, of Syrian people who are uh, moving out, uh, uh, really moving out of Turkey at this point, and some of them are going into Europe. And here are a couple of titles on newspaper. So the title of newspaper are always putting this dramatic number and this very emphatic type of uh, uh, statement. Statement. Wars refugee uh, exceed the record 60 million, and uh, Europe is in the worst crisis in terms of refugee since World War. And admittedly, if you follow this, the image that goes with these are so dramatic and heartbreaking that you need to take all this seriously. But let me put in perspective a little bit these numbers. So first of all, as dramatic and as important uh, refugees are, they are a very, very small part of the total migrants in the world. Uh, on the left hand side we have refugee, on the right hand side we have migrants, and uh, refugees are about 10% of total migrants. Most migrants, even from poor country, even from very poor country, move out because they decide uh, to do so. And also the second important thing is the blue, the difference between the blue and the red. Most refugee, and those 60 million in particular, are internal refugee, are refugee who are displaced within the country where they are from. And also most migrants are really internal migrants. So the blue is the number of total internal migrants in the, in the world. A billion people is moved in internally, while uh, this uh, red part is the number of international migrants. And these are the refugee. These are the refugee internally, and these are the refugee in the world. So first fact, refugee are a very small fraction of migrants, and migration is a massive phenomenon that start and is overwhelming internal in countries and part is abroad. So connecting to those, remember that 60 million uh, first title page, well that 60 million are all the refugees in the world including the internally displaced. How many are internally displaced of those 60 million? Well two thirds are. Only 20 million of people in the world are refugees in other countries. And even if you zoom in the Syrian crisis, which is the one we're talking about, the calculation is that there are almost 7 million of displaced people in Syria, but 4 million of them are displaced internally. And actually, the part that comes to Europe, which is the one that has, done, has made more noise, is a small fraction. Most of these refugees that are not internally displaced are in Turkey and are in Jordan. Now, 
Is really this a number of refugees relative to the European population that signify a crisis of unproportional historical uh, nature? Well, if you look at what is in terms of in relationship to the population of Europe, so if you look at the application for refu uh, for, of refugee, the refugee application per person in Europe, actually 2015 does not even look, look that bad. So this is, there was a little range because 2015 we're still calculating, but taking the upper part of the range, uh, the number of refugees relative to the population is about 0.3% uh, of the total European population. And actually, in the period right after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the World War, there were several more refugees per, uh, per person, per capita. So, of course, the refugee situation is very serious and is very important, but I would say we need to distinguish between number and lack of organization and surprise that comes from little planning. So re even 1 million refugees per year in Europe are only 0.25% of the European population, which is about 500 million, 350 million of which are working. So in a sense, if, this, if there is a policy to distribute, to organize, not to be surprised by this, this is a problem that can be dealt with or is a flow that can be dealt with much more easily than if they are encamped kept there, and every time that they try to come to Europe, we are surprised by this. The US, with a population which is smaller than Europe, has admitted 1.5 million immigrants every year in the last 20 years in the US. So admitting a million of immigrants to Europe doesn't seem to be very large. It's just that the surprise, lack of organization, and the concentration is creating this problem. Now let's come to the US and some headlines in the US. So what makes the US headlines instead are the undocumented immigrants. Um, what you, maybe a number that you have heard uh, circulated is that there are about 11 and a half million of undocumented in the US. And of course, the suggestion in that a lot of that are coming in from Mexico, so building a, a wall is gonna help uh, to at least stop this flow. And second, uh, these unlawful uh, immigrants or immigrants who are undocumented are a very big fiscal cost. They are poor, they need health care, they need a lot of this. So let me put in perspective these uh, three facts. So it's very, it's true, 11.4 million is a correct number here, but what is really needs to be emphasized is that uh, in the last 10 years, so since 2005, 2006, the number of undocumented immigrants in the US has been actually flat. So the period in which immigrants uh, undocumented were coming in the US were the 90s and a little bit the 2000s. But since the economic crisis of 2006, this number is actually declined a little bit. What is more interesting is that not only this net, uh, uh, the amount of undocumented immigrants is relatively constant, but a wall to Mexico will actually prevent them from going back rather than coming in here because the number of immigrants from Mexico has dropped dramatically in the last 20 years. In fact, the period of Mexican immigration was the 2000. And then since the, since the, uh, since the recession, say 2006, this number has gone down a lot. Now, even in gross terms, in total number of my Mexican that every year come, Mexico is not even any longer the biggest country that sends uh, uh, people to, to the United States. In 2014, this is for you, but it's true also later, China really is. So uh, uh, the, the wall with Mexico will prevent some from going back. And I say this because that number that I showed you is the gross, the total number that come. But if you take the total number of Mexican that have come, net of those who have gone back, actually migration from Mexico has been negative for at least the last nine years. This is the net number of change in population of Mexican in the US. In the 95, 2000, it grew a lot. But since 2005, this number has been declining. And in the last four years, it's been declining relatively fast. Why? In part has been the recession, which has changed and has destroyed a lot of the construction job, uh, low skill manufacturing job that Mexicans were coming from. But also the demographics of Mexico have changed so dramatically. The young generation in Mexico, only young people really migrate above years, not very many. The young generation in Mexico has shrunk a lot. Mexico has gone from a fertility of seven children per family to two. So there are many fewer people who will be uh, coming and border security is essentially massive. So in a sense, uh, the idea that we can improve further in reducing the amount of immigrants from Mexico and they constitute a, a current problem, I think is misled. 
how costly they are. Well, I will go back to this. I just wanted to here do a snapshot of this. Now, what is true is that a lot of immigrants from Mexico are low skilled in the sense that they have low level of education. They have uh, less than a high school degree. However, they work in proportion which, has, which are, for that group, massively larger than, that, than corresponding or similar American individual. So this is uh, what percentage of income comes from wages, so not from welfare transfer, from food stamp, from SSI and other, I will show this. What percentage of income fr come from wages for people who have low education, no high school degree? Well, the income of Mexican individual come 80%, this is over time, 80% of more, uh, in some period almost 100%, 80% of more comes from wages. For American individual in the same level of education, less than 30% of their income or 30, 40% of their income come from wages. So in terms of cost, if you assume that uh, some of them are low educated, so their wages are not going to be that high, but a lot of them really work and most of them, uh, uh, their income is overwhelmingly constituted by wages, vis-a-vis -vis the fact that similar American, to the contrary, are on welfare at very high rates at that low level of education. So, those two facts that you knew, if you put them a little bit in perspective, uh, now you start thinking that the problem is not stopping Mexican and really preventing them from taking advantage of our welfare system and is not even that of considering the crisis of refugee as huge, but is how to uh, how to um, uh, channel, in a sense, and how to think of policy that can make the best out of this flow that we have. The fact that you don't hear very much is that uh, in the last 10 years, the restrictive immigration policy of the United States really have hurt the most uh, highly educated people who want to come in the United States. College educated people are by far the group that has grown most in the United States. It has always been highly overrepresented among immigrants, but in the last period, in the last 10 years particularly, and among college educated, what is called the STEM type of people, scientists, technology, engineering, and math people, are massively overrepresented among Americans. And the group of fastest growing, and now close to be the largest group of immigrants in the US are really the students, the foreign students. That is the group that has grown the most. So if you think about immigration policy of the US in the future, these two are going to be two concerns that you need to put in the top. So this is the growth of a visa issued to high-skilled worker. H-1B is the one that goes at the top scientist or the high-skilled scientist and engineer. This number of visa has increased by 60% in the last, in the five years leading to 2014. This is the group that is growing, not the Mexican less educated, that is shrinking fast. In fact, if you look at the total people who work in STEM and are college educated in the US, this is the percentage of the labor force of people who work in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And the red part is the US born, and the blue part is the foreign born. And here I take a long perspective from 1980 to 2010. So in 1980, almost all the science, technology, and engineer, or at least 80% of them were American, were US born. This is a percentage, and it was, the total was 2% of the labor force. This percentage has grown to almost 4% of the labor force in 2010, and now one in four is foreign born. And the whole growth that happened in this period, this number has stayed relatively constant. The growth has come from foreign born. So the growth in science, technology, engineering, and math people in the US has come because of this large inflow of highly educated. And I will tell about the impact that this has on innovation, on technology, on science. But as you can see, this is a very important part. The students. The students are the big phenomenon of the last five to 10 years. These are the visa for F1, F1 visa student issuance from, for all countries in the world. And this has almost doubled in the last five years. So the first point that I want to make with uh, this is that if I have to describe the last 10 years of immigration in the United States, the picture that the numbers say are that uh, the large group that is growing are highly educated, and in large part, these groups come from Asia. They're Indian, they're Chinese, they are in, in smaller part Filipino, Korean. And a large chunk of them come as college students. 
To the contrary, in the last 10 years, the percentage of Mexican in the US has decreased. And in perspective, this trend are probably going to continue because of the aging of the Mexican population and the type of jobs that are created in the United States, much more in the high end of the human capital rather than the low end. Third, refugees are very important because they are they need to be protected by some international community, given that they are displaced from their, from their houses. But a lot of them are going to be displaced internally, so it's going to be particularly hard. You know, the Syrians who are in Syria, who are refugees, obviously are going to be very hard to be taken care of by the international community. And as a percentage of all the immigrants, there is a small number. So they do deserve a particular attention. But I would say this should be... Uh, framed the policy towards refugee in policy towards immigration overall. So if these are facts that uh, uh, I try to clarify, let me now go into illustrating a little bit what are the global trends of immigration. Is it really true that the last 10 years have seen an explosion of immigration all over the world, or the last 10 years are not different from what has been happening for a much longer time? So I'm going to show you some numbers that have to do with the US, and then we'll zoom into the US. But US in comparison to Western Europe, I take uh, the, all the 15 countries of Western Europe, and Canada and Australia. Australia, which are other two, other two destination, very large destination of immigrants. And also I'm going to distinguish immigrants that go to this country from other rich country and from poor country. And then I will distinguish immigrants who have high level of education and low level of education. Because as I said, it's important for policy reasons to think of this group as a somewhat different. So first, let me aggregate all rich countries. So I put together EU, US, Western Europe, Canada, and Australia. And I'm showing you just one line, this, in terms of how much immigrant as percentage of the population of all rich countries have grown in the last or in the 25 years leading to 2015. So what you start getting the idea is that immigration is a slow and strong force that is shaping a little bit, but has not had a particular strong boom in the last 20 years. In fact, this trend, the population in rich country, immigrants, they've gone from about 8% of the population to about 14% of the population. But this has been a slow and steady progress, not a boom that has happened uh, very, recently, uh, 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 very recently. One thing is true. If you split immigrant from those that come from non-rich country and those, that come, and those that come from rich countries, there are quite a lot of people who move uh, you know, from a rich to a rich, from Italy to the United States, from UK to Australia. But the large growth has really come from people who are coming from poorer country into to richer countries. So this, yes, seems to be an aggregate tendency, but not a tendency that has exploded in the last five years, a tendency which slowly is shaping how the world has evolved in the last 30 years, in fact. And now let's differentiate across these four group of countries that I saw. Does the US look very different from Europe, from Canada, or from Australia? This is the immigrant as a percentage of the population in the US, in Europe, in Canada, and in Australia. The levels are different. Canada and Australia have more immigrants as a percentage of the population than the US, and Europe even less. But the trend are also relatively similar. These countries have all increased slowly and regularly their percentage of immigrants. I am emphasizing this slowly and regularly because then when I go to policy, I will say it's not hard to predict and to plan ahead when you know that there is a phenomenon that is slowly evolving. If the, the phenomenon every time that you talk about catches you by surprise because you have not talked about that, then yes. But these have been slow trends. Now, I wanted to emphasize, then how big is this immigration? So let me take the change in the United States. The United States in 25 years has gone from 9% of its population to about 13% a four percentage point increase over 25 years. Well, I mean, it's big, it's small, uh, it's certainly not insignificant, but I would say, but it's similar to what has happened in this other country. Has there been some country which have experienced a significantly faster or different growth in immigration? Well, the only country, and this I only put the European here, but this is really the one exception among the relatively big country in the world. The only country which had a period of a really faster immigration relative to this, uh, uh, to this increase, which is roughly a one quarter of a percentage point per year, is Spain during the 2000. 
You rarely hear talking about, talk about Spain immigration from 2000 and 2010. Those immigrants went, a lot of them worked. In fact, a, a few of them, uh, when there was the big recession in Spain, went back to their country. But uh, this has attracted much less attention that uh, single big phenomena, so uh, that have happened maybe more recently or in the US. And they have been fully, a lot of them have been absorbed. So if you have to identify a country that had a fast immigration in this period, uh, growth, this is really Spain in the 2000s. And the fact that uh, uh, these immigrants have been integrated relatively well, again, this is eight percentage point over a decade, means that um, maybe even that rate was not so uh, incredibly uh, fast. Now, is it true also for each one of our countries that most of the inflow of immigrants came from poor countries, so that slow trend came mostly from immigrants from non-rich countries? And the answer is yes. If even for each one, for Europe, US, Canada, Australia, the long-term growth, which is relatively slow but seems relatively steady, comes from inflow. This is the inflow or the growth of percentage of immigrants from poor country into this, vis-a-vis -vis the percentage of immigrants from rich countries, that's flat. For Australia went down a bit, but for the other countries flat. So immigrants, people move across rich country, but the new phenomenon of the last 30 years is that more people have moved from the poor to the rich, but not in burst, not in explosions, in slow trend that have shaped a little bit the, uh, the population over two, three, four decades. And again, this is true also for Europe and is true also for the episode of Spain. This, bust in this boom in immigration in Spain claim from immigrants from non-rich country, particularly from Latin America, uh, from North Africa, and in part from the Eastern Europe that went uh, to Spain. So, slow process that has been going for 25, 30 years, and in part these people come, or in large part, come from poor countries. Okay, they come from poor country, but are they the huddled masses of a lot of people with no skill coming to rich countries, or are they actually a very strong selected group from this country with relatively high education that come to rich country? And again, this can also come to a surprise for, to you, but overwhelmingly, these people are at least as well educated as the population that receives them. How do you see this? This is the percentage of immigrants in Europe. This, sorry, this is the aggregate of all rich countries and how this has uh, grown in uh, the, the percentage of immigrant. Uh, immigrant as a percentage of the total population. Then the dashed line here is immigrant as a percentage of the population with secondary education or less. And this is immigrant as a percentage of your population with more than secondary education. Now, if immigrants were particularly large and particularly disproportionate towards the low skill, you would observe this percentage to be higher than the average. The average of these two gives this. To the contrary, what is true is that even if uh, this difference has become smaller for Europe, there have been as many highly educated coming in as less educated. So the balance of these two groups has remained relatively stable. For the US, I will go in, but for the US, if you cut this between non-college and college educated, the US has had many more college educated immigrants as a percentage of the college educated population relative to non-college educated. So the immigration in the US, if you split it at college, is particularly highly educated relative to both the population of, of American and other countries in the world. This changes a little bit the perspective with which we're looking. But the US is worth a much closer attention and is worth zooming in. Even if I wasn't going to give this lecture in the US, I think the US is worth uh, particular attention on this because I think this is an interesting, uh, uh, there are some characteristics that I want to dig out a little bit more of the immigration in the United States. So first of all, still to put things in perspective, the US is not at a historical high in terms of immigrant as a percentage of the population. That's the right metric, right? Because the population of the US has grown so much that if you just compare the numbers of immigrants back in 1900 and now, they are very different. But as a percentage of the population, the US still had several, it reached the peak in the early 1900 with about 14, 0.4% of immigrant, uh, of population from immigrants. And now they're going up, but as you see the trend of uh, US growth is slowing. The current percentage of foreign born in the US is about 13.4%. So the US has been here before in this type of immigration. Now one very interesting thing of immigration in the US 
I have told you that there are more highly educated relative to less educated that come, but that's not really the whole story. In the US, the distribution of immigrants is very bimodal, is said, in the following sense. This graph show you what percentage of each one of this group is foreign born. And I have arrayed this group by level of skills in a sense, starting from people who do not have a high school degree and mostly work in manual type of jobs, to people who have a high school degree, some college, associate degree, a bachelor, and these people work in the type of jobs, I will get back to this, that use cognitive communication, interaction, sales, management. And then we have masters, PhD and PhD in STEM, science and engineering. And this bar is what percentage of that group is foreign born. So you see that in 2010, but this picture is very similar in 2015, the extreme group, the very highly educated and very highly sort of uh, uh, academic group have, so look, almost 40% of the PhD in science and almost 30% of the PhD who work in the United States are foreign born. But also, about 40% of people who do very low level of job. And then in the intermediate part, many fewer. Now when you cut at bachelor degree, which is what I've done before, then bachelor degree is about the average. There are 14% of bachelor degree from, uh, from abroad and, and, and uh, the remaining 86%. So if you cut here, you have that the, the population of immigrant and native is balanced, but really the population of immigrant is either very, very highly educated or relatively low educated. Now this, I will argue, is a, makes a, uh, for some very positive effect of immigrants in the US. I will get there because the, the gains, the economic gains from immigration, and I would argue also some of the social gains, although with some problem maybe, come from having people who are different in their skills, in their type of jobs, in their distribution from Americans. If we had just identical clones of Americans coming in, this will increase the size of the US, but it wouldn't generate opportunity for trading complementarities, which is what I will talk about, while the difference generates this. This is another number that shows to you that, uh, another table that shows to you that immigration in the United States has always been college intensive not just in the recent period, so as a percentage of, of the group in the 70s, the inflow of immigrants was 6 to 11 percent among highly educated, but was only 4 percent on the average population. And again, this percentage is 8, 7, 8 percent among highly educated in the 2000s, when as an inflow of the population, the immigration rate is only 44 uh, uh, percent. So there are a lot of people, the, the decade that was a little different, if you like, in that that decade had a lot of inflow at the very low level of uh, education was the 90s, not the 2000s or the 2010s, which have gone back to have few people or relatively few at low level and a lot at high level. In that period was the inflow of Mexican that generated the debt, but that was a kind of a historical circumstance. Mexicans were young, the economy of Mexico was doing very badly. There was almost, I mean, American uh, firms were almost happy to hire them. And, uh, um, and, and so that, that, that is the anomaly, not uh, the fact that immigration has been high skill intensive in the other period. So the concept that I want to carry home here, and I'm going to show you now some going to the, from the numbers to the impact that immigrants may have on the US is that economists help us here understand why immigration can generate some gain. And these gains come from the differences between immigrant and native. How are immigrants and native different? First of all, immigrants are mostly younger than natives. Less educated immigrants, so taking that spike at the uh, left end of the graph, a lot of them are willing and uh, in comparative advantage term, I don't want to use technical uh, uh, language, but because they don't know the language maybe as well, they're willing in, spe in specializing in type of manual jobs, in type of jobs uh, in services, uh, care of the elderly, food services, agricultural uh, services, manufacturing services, and so, at low level of education, we will see that these immigrants offer supply a lot of this manual job. And I will show you in a, in a second that this low level of education, they work a lot more per person than US born work. 
For the highly educated, well, highly educated immigrants are also different from native. For one, they are much more focused in STEM type of jobs, science, technology, engineering, and math. And again, it can be a comparative advantage, right? Solving a differential equation is done the same way all over the world. Building a reactor all over the world so the smartest people from China, India, Philippines can come and do it. Being a lawyer in the United States, being an archive history historian, requires a location type of specific type of knowledge that make them hard. So the fact that they are focused in STEM, many have the PhD, more have PhD, put them in some jobs which can complement and can generate surplus. So let me talk about the low skilled a second, or the people who don't have an high school degree. And I think here the difference is striking. When I was looking at this number, I almost had a hard time believing myself. The employment rate of that group is low. We all know that the people without a high school have been struggling in the US. They don't find a job, their job that they find, maybe the major problem in the US is that they don't find a job and the job don't pay very much. The employment rate of people without a high school degree for Mexican immigrant is 71%, which is roughly the employment rate, so employment population ratio of the, of the aggregate US population, including the PhD and the college educated. For American, for US born, the employment rate is to the contrary around 0.4%, much lower. So a low end of the job, uh, of the spectrum, these immigrants who are not rich, who are relatively uh, poor, are working poor though, much more than Americans who are depending in part. Uh, what is the rest? What do people who don't work? A lot of them uh, have to rely on uh, welfare type of transfer, um, food spends, stamps, disability, social security. A lot of Americans in this situation have maybe some alcohol problem, some, uh, uh, some health related issue, and so the difference is large. In fact, if you look at how much these low educated people use any type of social security pro uh, uh, program, how much of their income comes from social security, every social security program is used much more by native than by Mexican immigrant. So this is how, what percentage of income uh, come from disability for low educated US born, this is for Mexican. This is what percentage of income come from food stamp for US born from Mexico. What, what percentage of income come from unemployment insurance, worker compensation, and veterans uh, transfer? This is US born, this is Mexican. So, and this is uh, from uh, uh, supplemental uh, security income, US born Mexican immigrants. So Mexican immigrants at low level of the spectrum don't, don't rely a lot on social security. Yeah, in part because they don't even qualify for, social, for all these programs. Some, if you are undocumented, you don't qualify. But even if you are documented in many states after the reform of 1996, some of these non-citizens don't qualify. So they depend much less on this. They work a lot. They work a lot uh, at the low level of income and they work a lot at a high level of income. So the next uh, type of criticism that people say is that, okay, maybe they don't cost to social security, but they cost in American jobs. They cost because those, why are those American not working at low end? Because the um, foreign born are. Well, if you believe that, and you don't want to look at any data, sure, that's what you're gonna say, that's the reason, and I cannot do anything about that. But if you're willing to take a look at the data, let's look together how they look like. So the first is, um, let me just first show you the data. One way in which, uh, I, there has been, this is an area in which there has been so much research that you can be bored, uh, we spend weeks, uh, and I have spent uh, years of my life here. It was just to describe some, some, some easy facts on this with some maps, which are relatively easy to understand. So one way to see if immigrants and natives, when they move in a place, they, they are in the same labor market, they compete with each other or not, is to look at places that absorbed a lot of immigrants versus places that did not absorb any immigrant at all, and see if the native workers have a lower wage or have lower employment in places that absorbed a lot of immigrants. This is a correlation, of course, because then you need to look at all the other factors that could have affected this. But let's start from this correlation. This is a map of the United States divided in what economists call commuting zone, which are essentially labor market, are areas in which people work and live more or, more or, more or less within the same. And here, the dark color means in the 40 years between 1970 and 2010, how much the population of that uh, labor market area is grown because of immigrants. What has been the growth? Some areas in California, in um, Nevada, Arizona, Texas, have had an increase in immigrants from few percentage point of the population, 3-4, to 40%, so massive. 
Other areas have had very few immigrants, and then there are the metro areas here. So this is the map of where they are gone. So one interesting thing to look at is to see if these counties where a ton of immigrants went in are also counties where the wage of Americans have not done very well over these 40 years, or employment of Americans have not done very well. So rather than showing another map, I'm going to show you the scatter plot that comes from this map. So the scatter plot put on the horizontal axis the increase in immigrant as a percentage of the population. And on the vertical axis, this put the growth of wages of native US-born worker uh, uh, in percentage points. Now, if you expect that the places where a lot of immigrants, these are places where a lot of immigrants went, if this hurt or if this is correlated with the displacement, you would observe a negative relationship, right? More immigrants, lower wages for native. Or if, the, or if this is just noise, you'd want to observe much. But what you really observe in this correlation is a clear and very significant, for people who do some statistics, positive correlation. Places where a lot of immigrants went are also places where wages of, immigrant, wages of native worker went up. So there may be no causal correlation, but at the very least it's not true that if you pick up a count in the US, if a lot of immigrants went there, then a lot native did worse. The contrary is true. You pick a county, a lot of immigrants went there, wages of native increased more than average. How about employment growth? Employment growth similar but flatter. Count uh, labor market with more immigrant inflow or with less immigrant inflow did not uh, correspond to any difference in the employment change of natives. This is pretty flat. In fact, even statistically, this is not significant. So, Places where a ton of immigrants went did not reduce the employ or are not correlated with the lower employment of native, nor are correlated with lower wages. In fact, if anything, with a little higher wages. What about if we zoom on the less educated? We said, important to distinguish, just pay, take people who have a high school degree or less, and the wage of American with high school degree or less, how many immigrants went in debt? Again, if you observe any correlation, this is a positive correlation. By the way, here I have, uh, um, for people, these are decade changes, and I have uh, taken away the decade averages to make them all comparable and centered around, around the zero. So where a lot of immigrants go, the wage of less educated American has increased a little bit more than, uh, than on average. And this is for the highly educated, for highly educated even stronger. The places where more immigrants went, the wage of a highly educated American is going up uh, even more. So these are all correlation. And again, I am not going to go uh, uh, here in detail, but uh, uh, my, my work or a, a, a large bulk of my work has been trying to figure out how come immigrants that go in a place do not displace Americans? How come immigrants that go, or first of all, if this correlation is really uh, well uh, uh, representing reality correctly, if there are other things that I'm forgetting. And I would say that I have run a lot of regression here controlling, our economists say, or accounting for many other effects. The effect of sector growth, which is different across counties in the US. Technological adoption, which is different across the US. Openness to trade. And even if you add all this control, the most you get is zero relationship between immigrant and the native here, in, done in these uh, changes. So why? Why is that immigrant come in a place and native don't, are not hurt? Well, again, each one of these lists here has a several paper. When immigrants come and supply some type of job, firm can expand and can create other type of job. If you have an agricultural worker, you need an agricultural supervisor, and a lot of Americans are supervisors rather than work. Second, as I told you before, Immigrant and low level of skills do different jobs, so they are complementary. You need people who do manual job to run a clinic and to assist the elderly, but also you need people who are doing the accounting. Typically, uh, when you have more people who do the uh, 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 manual type of job, uh, uh, the, the response is to create more complementary job. In response to this inflow of immigrants in many sectors, natives specialize in non-manual type of job. And finally, as far as highly immigrant, uh, high, high skilled immigrants are concerned, they probably are also increasing productivity because they are bringing innovation, technology. It's not a mystery that Silicon Valley and a lot of the firms in Silicon Valley have been founded by Indians, some by Chinese. So this has brought clearly more productivity and more jobs. 
all that correlation and all this uh, analysis that you do in aggregate always leaves you the doubt that you have forgotten some other factor that may be responsible both for the inflow of immigrants and for this positive effect on wages. But I think there are a couple of interesting cases here that uh, I have examined or re-examined recently that I think seems to say that even taking some episode of immigration which are relatively sudden and relatively low skilled, we don't observe those big negative wage impact or we don't observe much of an impact, negative impact at all uh, on American workers. So one of these cases is the famous Mariel Botlift. So this is one of one episode in which Cuban refugee came in the United States because Fidel Castro decided that they could go in uh, April, uh, from April to June to 1980. And so about 120,000 of them went into Miami. So economists have been looking at this for a long time. David Card first said, yeah, look at these labor markets. There has been no impact. And, I, and, uh, uh, and this boat lift, these refugees were less educated. And so uh, they would have been a perfect example of a big inflow in a labor market that could generate a negative effect. And here, I just, uh, we redid uh, this uh, analysis uh, uh, very uh, recently with a little bit more modern statistical technique and just focus on this. Uh, this is the wage in Miami and these are the way for low educated and these are the wages in similar cities. So what statistics, uh, statisticians do sometimes is, okay, to see if there is an effect of an event, let me take uh, one uh, type of uh, uh, patient, quote unquote, which is Miami and another patient and let me give the drug to Miami and not to the other patient, and the drug is the inflow of immigrants, and see if that has an impact. And in fact, the economists use the treatment control type of language. So let's choose a group of cities that behaved similarly to Miami up to 1975. This is when Miami was shocked by an inflow of immigrants. Did wage in Miami drop relative to the control? Well, in this particular sample, they actually went up a little bit, but they bounce up. There are a lot of measurement error. So not much is happening uh, between Miami and control. For wage of less educated, this is another way of measuring wages of less educated, taking the 15th percentile. This is unemployment. Did unemployment in Miami, which is the continual line, bounced up relative to the rest? To me, it seems that there is not much. There are, uh, 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 so this is one example. Another interesting example of a similar experiment, uh, which has been uh, taking place in Denmark, Europeans are all uh, in arm because there is this refugee crisis, but they forgot that in 1993, 94, and 95, they had a refugee crisis which was as severe and as big as this, and it was the Bosnian War crisis. The Bosnian War sent to the rest of Europe, in particular to northern country and to uh, Germany, a number of refugees which was uh, as large currently, I mean, it depends on how long it goes. Right now, I think uh, Syrians are about one million, but comparable. So what we did is we went to back to Denmark. Denmark had this uh, program in distributing refugees across uh, their, uh, their counties. And the great thing of this program is that it was relatively random where this refugee went. And so we compared uh, some counties that got a lot of refugees versus county that didn't get a lot of refugees. And we looked if the wage of Danish people in county that got a lot of refugees dropped relative to the wage in places that didn't get. This, uh, the continuous line that I am showing, is the difference in wage between counties that got a lot of refugees and counties that did not get. And this is the shock of the Bosnian. So if you think that Bosnian displaced the Danish, you should observe that first the wages are similar in the two type of country and then they drop. What you observe, if anything, is a little bit of the, the opposite. That after this, uh, the wage of, of uh, Danish went up a bit. And in that paper, we go in and we say, why? Why is that the Danish wage go up a bit? And it turns out that wages that tend to change their job as these people came in and leave some of the manual job, which were done by refugee, and do what we call the more complex job. They moved towards job, which were more, so again, from construction workers, some of them were bumped up to be supervisor and to work with that. From, uh, from janitor, they went up to run the janitorial company and go up. So, even if you don't believe that there was really a positive effect, uh, these, uh, these dotted ones are the so-called confidence band, uh, but even if you don't believe that there was really a positive effect, and in fact on the supply of labor there was essentially a zero effect, there doesn't seem to be a negative effect. So, overall, 
focusing on these uh, uh, low-skilled immigrants and focusing on how economy, how the US and other economies have absorbed them, it looks like they're taking this long-run perspective. They don't seem to be this negative impact because the economy adjusts, because new opportunities are created, firm expand, new jobs which are complementary are created. Now, um, I am coming uh, to the end of my uh, talk, so I want to, uh, now I've talked a little bit about low-skilled, want to go back a little bit to the high-skilled immigrant, because I think that for the US, high-skilled immigrants not only have a lot of the characteristics that I said before, they don't do exactly the same job of natives, so they don't hurt them as much, but really the US has this advantage versus the rest of the world, that they really attract you guys really attract the brilliant people in the world. I'm going to show you this, and this has got to be, it's a bit hard to quantify, but this is going to be a very, very strong advantage in science and technology in the US. And this is because the US University and the US Research Center, no matter what ranking you look at, are at the very top. And high skilled in the world are mobile, and they want to go, the top people want to go in the top uh, places. So just to give you an idea of how much attracting these foreign brains has been vital for US growth and excellence in science and technology, this is the number of PhD which have been awarded in the US. And this goes back 80 years, 1935, and here it stops actually in the 2000s. But the interesting thing, this is the aggregate, the cumulated number of uh, uh, PhDs. The blue are the ones which are awarded to US born, and the red to foreign born. So you see that there were two periods in which the PhDs have gone up a lot. One was the 50s and the early 60s, the space race, the Cold War funded research. And this was US born that went into PhD, but then the US born into PhD flattened out. They didn't uh, attract it very much. And then the following big boost, uh, boom of this, which is the information technology boom, this was fully fueled by an increase in foreign born. So the US has more and more people in science and technology in large part because it can take from the rest of the world. Now you can argue that these are not necessarily the best in the PhD, but you cannot argue with this graph here. These are the Nobel laureates in the United States accumulated in the, uh, in the last 40 years. And uh, I have only put the, the four countries that have won most Nobel laureate. The US, which is far above everybody. Then there is Germany, there is, uh, um, uh, there, there is sorry, uh, there is Germany, there is France, and there is UK. So this is UK, this is Germany, and this is France, much lower. The dashed, the thick line is the Nobel laureate in the US who are foreign born. So as many Nobel laureate as the whole United Kingdom have been sort of raised in the US. And so the US has added an innovation and excellence potential to its own science and technology as large as the United Kingdom at this very top end by allowing people to come in. 25% of Nobel laureates vis-a-vis uh, -vis a population which is only 12% foreign born are foreign born in the US. I would be disingenuous if I would say that this is an easy thing, talking about immigration, all the benefits, without acknowledging the huge challenges that this will, that immigration bring. Of course, at the low level of a, a, the low skilled immigrant, even if they work, even if they contribute, there is a big issue and a big problem of integrating, assimilating. Will, they, uh, will their children do better than they did in terms of schooling? Are they segregated in part uh, of the US and can they be integrated? I will say a couple of things in the last uh, five minutes, of, uh, hopefully I have, or three or four, about what I think are cre key challenges. Obviously, there are a lot of non-economics non related issue. I know very well that some people uh, are go, um, say that cultural differences uh, generate tension in the uh, society, and this uh, is a problem. And maybe more immigrant also will make uh, uh, American a little bit more, some, there is some research that says they make them a little bit more stingy, in the sense that you don't want to redistribute pay taxes if you think that, if you think that what you are giving is going to go to fund people that are not like you. And so these are really issues that social scientists are studying. But let me leave you with three few ideas on what I think are very important ingredients. I'm not going to go into detail of immigration policy is complicated, outdated, and we need to upgrade it. But there are some ideas that I think need to be part of a successful policy. First, immigration is a slow force that is changing the world. It's not an unpredictable today, tomorrow thing. So, 
if we want to tackle this, we need plan, planning. Europeans need to sit down and know that in the next three, four years, a certain number of Syrians will come. They will have to decide what to spend to distribute them, how to integrate them, and that will increase the benefit and decrease the cost. Disorganization, encampment, surprise, chaos, those are very costly. Not the migrants. The migrants are the asset. The lack of organization is the cost. Second, you cannot do a policy that moment by moment deal with the emergency because then you're going to have a very unbalanced type of immigration. I think that a rich country in part can choose the immigrant that they get, but the choice cannot be everybody out the way I see it. It has to be that given that there are a lot of highly educated and some less educated that can come and work, you need to have a policy that balances the inflow of both and doesn't completely distort the distribution of the population and of the labor market. Refugees are a very important part, but I think they need to be in this picture that they need particular attention. But if you already have a system in which the low skilled can come in, have a way of being absorbed in the labor market, the refugee can also uh, benefit from this. I think that on this one thing, US got it 100% right and Europe didn't, which is I would say that the single most important thing for the success, for the integration, for the, uh, for the assimilation of the immigrant is that they can have access to the labor market. Immigrants come to the U.S. to work. And immigrants that can work, as I've shown you, I don't think there is any evidence that they displace, they complement, they create. But in Europe, a lot of the immigrants come and many of the refugees cannot enter, cannot even have a job legally, because until you are, you have, while you are an asylum seeker, you cannot work, then you certainly are more of a burden on the welfare state. You have seen that American immigrants are less relying on the welfare state than natives. In Europe, the reverse is true. Immigrants are more reliant because they cannot work, many of them, because of restriction. So I would also argue that the US system of admitting immigrants should be shifted more towards labor immigration. Not high skilled, high and low skilled. There, is, there are a lot of jobs which are done. A key thing, though, in the long run, in order to absorb successfully the immigrant, in an area where there seems to be some strain and some problem, is that the second generation of immigrant need to be essentially become as similar or need to, in economic uh, terms, need to be as close to America as possible. And I think this comes from schooling, access to schooling. It's very well uh, uh, established that school districts where a lot of low-income immigrants are, are under strain. So given that the immigrants create wealth, as I, um, as I argued, and generate economic activity, I think that some of the benefit of that economic activity have to go back in the local schools in order to allow, yeah, it's, it's a challenge sometimes to uh, educate uh, kids with a second language. And so more resources need to go in there. And those are not spend expenditure. Those are clearly investment because the second generation is important. More harmful to second generation immigrant than income inequality is stagnation. If you think of France and Germany, their huge problem is, they, is that they have a second generation of immigrants who don't really have had much economic success. And I think this is what can create a problem. And so, more or less uh, in time with my uh, allotted uh, one hour, I think that um, as much as uh, uh, the attention to immigration is so schizophrenic. Uh, 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 Trump talks about the, the border, the, the wall, everybody is either, oh yeah, 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 the, the undocumented are a huge problem, or oh my God, he's racist. I would love to have a more continuous uh, talk about this and planning about this, because immigration is a slow process, and if you look at the last 25 years, you can predict where it will be in the next five, six, 10 years, and you should plan policies that, uh, I would say, make the best and the most of this potential that immigrants bring. Employment, I think, has to be a key part of this. And immigration, which is employment-driven, to me, this is part of uh, uh, creating a successful system to absorb immigrants, to benefit from them, to grow. And uh, as a concept, I would say that the most, uh, in my, res my research focus on this impact of immigrant on native uh, wages, and I think is completely overstated this idea that this, there can be a negative uh, impact. 
Finally, highly educated should be incentivized, uh, should be let, so the US problem right now is not that there are not enough uh, top people who want to come, but that not as many can come because there are some limitations. I think the H1B visa program is one of the best thing that the US has done, and uh, I'm sure that in this university and in this audience there are a lot of people who are here on an F or an H1B, and I think this has allowed this growth, which is uh, very crucial, of science, technology, productivity, and, uh, and the economy. And uh, of course, of course, uh, all that I said today, and I think uh, you know, right, I have been particularly uh, emphatic on the importance uh, of this positive aspect and on the opportunity. All that I said today come with challenges. Challenges that are some people are very opposed to the idea of having more people, uh, more immigrants, or even some people don't accept the ones who are here uh, currently right now um, um, as uh, undocumented or even as, uh, uh, you know, F uh, student, H1B, they want them to go back. And I know that this is a complicated conversation, but I think uh, we cannot ignore the fact and the potential, which are huge. And and uh, uh, I, leaving you on a positive note, I think that uh, uh, hopefully eventually somebody will listen. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. So in aggregate, in aggregate is pretty balanced. But then if you look at group by group, there could be some important differences. So um, the immigration that is driven, a lot of immigration which is driven by specific jobs could be either specifically male or female. So for instance, Filipino is a group in which the female immigration seems to be particularly large because nurses, house assistants, and elderly assistants are a big group and in general uh, are women, um, which creates some opportunity but also some uh, risks. Some of these women come and leave their kids in the Philippines with all the consequence of that. Uh, Latin American immigration, they used to be very male because of this uh, uh, sort of manual type of job in agriculture, which uh, was uh, preferentially male. Uh, it's become a little bit more balanced because there are several of these manual jobs uh, we, which are done by uh, uh, female. I wouldn't say that the gender balance is not uh, uh, so uneven. It's relatively even in most uh, group. Uh, where immigrants are uh, sort of, uh, if I had to characterize Immigrant, the average immigrant is younger than the American, is either less educated or much more educated, and it comes from Latin America or Asia. And is on average half man and half woman, I would say. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, earlier in your comments, you made a few references to illegal versus legal immigrants. Um, you didn't make any distinctions later on. So, when I hear you compare U.S. versus immigrants, are those illegal and legal, or are they simply legal immigrants? They are illegal and legal. All that I showed in the graph adds up the legal and illegal. In fact, in most of the official data that we use, which are census and CPS data, it's very hard to distinguish between legal and illegal. What you can distinguish is the place of birth, the level of education, and the, the job that they do. So a lot of that bar that you saw at 40% of manual job, a lot of those are undocumented, in fact. But all the number that I showed you and all the impact that I described are looking at the impact of both legal and, and illegal uh, immigrants in the US. Well, so it in total, so in to of all immigrants, uh, um, um, it will be 20% uh, of total immigrant uh, is illegal. But if then you look, but if you look only at the people who don't have a high school degree, then it will be 40%, right? If you if you look at it, but in total, it will be about 20, 25%. Yeah, 11 million versus 44. You might 
you're uh, working in the Eastern Cape, working in California, so I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, the uh, migrant exodus from the Dust Bowl in the 30s uh, into California. Um, you know, Steinbeck captures that quite well in the Great Giraffe. The you have this and you have this uh, constant motif of this this handbill that's you know, getting distributed all across the country that says they need workers. And then you, know, you have you have one of the migrants explaining it. Well, you know, you got you got the uh, hundred jobs. Well, and you can pay them five cents a bushel, or if you got a hundred people to show up, if you got eight hundred people to show up, you can pay them three cents a bushel. Um, would you would it, would it, you know in that in that instance it certainly seems like ways that we're depressed, but is that simply for that one market? And also, would you classify that as one of your as one of the examples you gave of of chaos, poor distribution? So, um, the, um, the example of the Grape of Wrath, which is sort of the agricultural economy, uh, the agricultural sector. Agricultural sector has uh, one factor which is fixed, which is land. And land is a key input in, in producing agriculture. And so, yes, in land, you can put as many people to work on a plot of land, but you don't. Uh, the industrial society we have, uh, in the US right now, the percentage of people in agriculture is about 1.5% of the population. Most of the people are in manufacturing and services. And manufacturing and services don't have that constraint because people People work, yes, with machines, with stuff, but that is reproduced. And mostly, people work with other people. And the going from the decreasing return type of economy to a constant or increasing return type of economy is the passage that you do when you go from agriculture to an industrial and service society. So in a service society, you need a lot of worker because the worker created uh, they do different tasks and job, and they also consume themselves. They also demand themselves. So there is that constraint is much much less strong. Now, if you have. Uh, many, many people showing all up in the same moment in a place and uh, this generate a, 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 and there is nothing set up to, to absorb them, eh, that can create a problem, no doubt. I would argue that the immigration from Mexico in the last 20 years has not been like that. The immigration from Mexico has been actually, people have gone knowing what job they were going to because their brother tell, they told them, come here, there is actually a job uh, for you. So, very different. Some of the refugee waves might have been like that, in part. The Cuban one that I discussed in the US was not even like that that one because there were a lot of Cubans in Miami who as these new Cubans came in were plugged in network they found job they found houses so it was easier the European situation yes like that in the short run Europeans don't know what to do Syrians are hard but again if you are a lot of these Syrians that go to Europe our doctor, our teacher, our, they're not. Uh, so again, the images are dramatic because these poor people are just kicked out, but a lot of them are professional. So in Germany, Germany has understood in part the potential value and is setting up a lot of program to hook them on with company. And I think that's the way. Slow down the emergency, set up something that can absorb them and sometimes helps. But I don't think that that constraint that there is 100 job and if one job goes to me, it doesn't go to you, that's not the modern economy. In the modern economy, there are either 100 or 200 jobs, depending on how many are created by firms and by, by other people. So that's the difference. Uh, sorry, I, I, I didn't catch the last part of you. So we have the lowest labor force participation. You were saying because, or you are giving a reason for that? What I'm saying is create a robust economy. Oh, yeah, create a robust economy, yes. Get rid of the anti business uh, policies that have been created in this country. And the fears of immigration, I think, get hard to mitigate. 
Uh, yeah, so um, absolutely. I mean, I am not, uh, I, uh, um, uh, economic policy are very important, uh, sort of uh, uh, taxation on business can be very costly in terms of creating jobs. Um, regulation can be uh, costly and here one has to uh, look at case by case. Now, uh, in fact, in terms of the, the low participation rate, uh, so the participation rate dropped dramatically during the recession and is going up, but it's going up back up relatively slowly. And uh, I would say that the American economy, um, there are some fundamental forces that are going to affect a lot business and growth in the American economy. And I would argue that some of these forces have got to be continue the science and technology leadership of the US, improve the quality of the schooling and in particular of secondary and tertiary education in the US. Those are going to be crucial, even for the business. Then, I guess you are alluding to taxation, regulation. I think those are important too, but I think that in the long run, what really drives a good chunk of the American productivity growth is given by the productivity, schooling, education of the labor force, creativity of its entrepreneur, and so science, technology, and those two things, I think, can be helped a little bit by immigration policy, which are targeted to that. They're not the panacea, they're not gonna be uh, solving, they have to be accompanied with uh, economic policy that uh, are, are strengthening our economy. But I think that I, personally, I am used to look at the very long trends here, and uh, while uh, sort of, yeah, uh, of course in the short run, tax policy are very important, uh, regulation policy are important. In the long run, these policies on education, technological growth, uh, competition, uh, uh, correct competition, both in the uh, goods and in the labor market, I think are also very important. And I think in this principle, immigration can help, can introduce and add a little bit of competition, schooling, technology, uh, labor force uh, uh, participation. The reason why, part of the reason why the, uh, the, the foreign born are participating into the labor force so massively at all level is, uh, I would say, that they have uh, harder access to welfare. And so here you have to wait a little bit. So harder access to welfare is making a lot of these low educated immigrants work a lot, while Americans who do have access to that when they have a problem or if their income drop below a certain level, they benefit from welfare, which is beneficial, we want that. But again, some of this uh, policy that you say, well, I mean, we should have less welfare for people to participate more in the labor force, but there is a trade-off, maybe. Okay, we just hit uh, 6.30 exactly. Uh, <laughs> and there is a reception uh, right now. There will be some opportunities if you want to talk to the speaker. And so I, I invite you to come on. Well, thanks for coming out.